get ready for more amazing stories, more inspirational stories to help you set your stories free. I created this podcast as a resource for Blacks, Asians, and those who love them to share stories and processes, as well as to build communities around important salient issues that affect all of us as humans. So on this show, you get to hear amazing stories from people like you who show us how to get more out of life. The stories featured here are by people whose journey I am partly inspired by, as well as challenged by, but most importantly, people whose courage and vulnerability have afforded us an opportunity to hear their life stories. And I hope you find them as inspiring. Now enjoy your show and don't forget to share this episode and the other ones. <laughs> Welcome back everyone. And today I have someone who reached out to me after I conducted a live show some weeks ago. So shout out to Kasia Hogard for um, actually making this connection happen, even though it wasn't quite direct. So today on the podcast, I have a wildlife photography of five years, and he's also a, a natural history connoisseur and also an, a, um, an art hobbyist. His name is Jonathan Middleton. And if you'll uh, if you check out his Facebook page or even on, on his Instagram, he has really wonderful close-up pictures of animals in the wild. And I can't wait to even explore just elements of his life and just everything that he's all about. So everyone, please join me in welcoming um, Jonathan Middleton to the podcast. Hi, Jonathan. Hello. Nice to meet you. <laughs> just, just call me Johnny, by the way. I feel old. Johnny. Yeah. Okay. 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 I was going to, that's going to be my next question. Cause I, I think I recall Kasha calling you Johnny, but I didn't want to be, you know, so forward and, you know, but anyways, thanks for coming to the podcast. And I recall this is your first podcast ever. Yeah, this is a little yeah. bit for me, so. You're in for a beautiful ride then. So let's just start. Let, let's start for those that don't really know you. This is where I get to ask you, you know, how you grew up, where you grew up, how many siblings you had, and all that kind of fancy stuff. So tell us a little bit about you, Jenny. Okay, where do I begin? So for one, I have three older siblings. So I'm the youngest of the four. 35, 30, 32. Honestly, I forgot, forgot her her actual age 26 and then me 24 i'm gonna be 25 this year in june um so i grew up originally in west haven connecticut so like it's like this southern portion of connecticut where it's like near like the shore lived there for like from like the day i was born to like maybe 10 i moved to middletown shout out to all those who are from middletown uh grew up there for like 13 years and I currently reside in Bristol basically uh so basically uh a town that's literally like smack dab in the state I'm in so it's like I'm kind of like far away from everything else which I don't mind because I kind of like the solitude and not interacting with too many people because people give me anxiety sometimes (laughs) but in any case um in terms of like my upbringing well, I mean, I grew up with both parents. Both of them are pastors, so they're a part of the ministry and stuff like that. So I'm a preacher's kid. But PK. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, but personally, as I got older, I kind of like deconstructed from that. Not to say that I don't appreciate the way my parents raised me and stuff like that, because I'm more than grateful. But, you know, obviously when you like grew up in an environment like that, you kind of you start to ask yourself like, why do I believe in these things? Things you believe in, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it, this? Do I believe in these things on my own accord, or do, am I just like basically following the herd, essentially? So, rather than you know just doing things because everybody else is doing, and I'm like, Jonathan, you could be your own man, do your own thing. Like, you're not hurting anybody. You're still a decent human being. So, you know, you don't have to believe in the exact same things that your family does but you know you can still keep those values either way mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. even if you do deviate a bit but, but okay. yeah i mean beyond that i mean i grew pretty comfortably in the suburbs like i never had to like struggle or anything so okay okay so the baby of the house yeah <laughs> I, I actually like being the baby of the house because like even if i do like some of the dumbest stuff that like my parents yeah. are like yeah, I'm gonna let it slide. <laughs> <laughs> and I imagine that the energy they had in raising your older ones, they probably it kind of dissipated with age when they had you. So it's like, eh, they became more chill. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm the first and have two brothers. And I'll tell you, sometimes I wonder. I don't think we grew up with the same parents because my dad's energy definitely went down by the time they had the last one because he's a little bit spot. So um, just want to confirm, Bristol, is that in Connecticut or um, Virginia or Tennessee? Connecticut. Connecticut. Okay, nice. I've been to Connecticut once. I liked that. It was um, Waterford. Um, what, what Waterford. Was that? Uh, Waterford. Yeah, no, no. yeah, I said at Waterford. It was quite beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I came in through Hartford, I think. But yeah, anyways, thanks for nicer. that. It's, yeah, yeah. It's I mean, nicer towns in Connecticut. Oh, oh really? <laughs> yeah, it's so beautiful. Even the coastline, the water. I mean, it's it felt like entering into a storybook, you know. Um. Anyways, well, thanks for that introduction of yourself. So, in your, in your 20s, what would you say are some of your struggling, um, like your 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 struggles right now as a twenty something year old um, navigating just your life and it might even be something quite as um, you can extrapolate it to maybe the current climb you know being in the U S or just your interest what are some struggles you currently face as a twenty something year old some of the stuff that I've been dealing with well yes. most of the, well the vast majority of the stuff that I've dealt with in the in the past have already been like rectified and handled so literally the only thing that I'm have to deal with right now. Is just basically being an adult living by himself with like two roommates. That's literally the only thing I have to worry about at this point. <laughs> yeah. Like and again, your roommate. Like, Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Again, everything that I've dealt with in passing, I've already crushed it. It's behind me now. Like obviously, I don't like just forget about it and just like oh, you know what happened. It's more like a, oh, okay, this happened. I'm yeah. gonna practice these things and yeah, you know, here you are. And uh, and I'm guessing I'm gonna ask about my, about the roommate situation. Literally, yeah, one yeah. Of I guess the people brought, you chose yeah. or people you just. I mean, I imagine I'm in college, correct? Well, n- well, currently no. I'm currently okay. not in college right now. But okay. one of my roommates is my older brother, and the other one is a good one of the few guy friends I have. So okay. it's like, so like we're just we all know each other. Okay, that's it's good. Like a, I was going to ask if it was something that was just, you know, like you, you were given a roommate because of, you know, college situation or you had to choose them, I guess. No, not like that. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I, I want to probe a little bit about the um, the constructing part of it because I didn't really catch that during your bio. So, um, I, I mean, I imagine that it's a time for you to ask questions and eventually find your path. But what has that been like for you, especially considering the heritage you were born into and how have your parents or even siblings been um, responsive of, or even supportive of this, your questioning path about, you know, the utility of faith in your life. Hmm. Uh, I don't know, because like, I, like I'll have conversations about them and I'll talk to them about like, you know, some stuff that I'm like, have like a level of skepticism about but i don't really go into details with them as much as i do with like let's say like a friend or my siblings or anyone else because it's like i don't know because like like with parents sometimes if you ask them questions about the things that they teach you that you you run to that problem where sometimes it feels like Sometimes they'll feel like, oh, like, what did I do wrong as a parent? And I'm like, no, I'm not I'm not saying that you're doing something wrong as a parent or that you failed me as a parent. I'm asking you these things because I want to have a better understanding of it. But if you're going to get defensive and upset with me asking questions without, like, you know, whatever, it's like, I don't know. In the back of my head, it's like you're giving me more of a reason to do it. You give me more of a reason to ask questions, really. I see. I see. I, I mean, I can imagine how, if we're looking at both ways, because for your parents, to them, it might seem like maybe they missed a step, but for you, it's more like this is me trying to find my path. Yeah. Well, that's a, well, that's the thing. It's not that they even missed the mark. Like you know, like both my both sides, of my family are religious, and you know, obviously there are they both are a product of their environments and stuff like that, and they're learning and growing as parents themselves, and 
like I said, I have a pretty solid relationship with my parents. Like every week, like I'll call my mom or dad who's like we like thirty minutes away and I'll be like, Hey Ma, you know, I just want to check in, you know, blah 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 and literally tell them what's on my mind sort of deal. So it's it's not like the relationship is like stagnant or bad. Yeah. It's like yeah. I don't want people to get that impression. I I freaking love my parents. So it's like Oh, that's good. That's good. I mean, I'm sure you I hope I do hope you find the answers you're looking for. But um for you right now what would you say, and I probably hate to put it this way, but just for um, simplification, um, how would you describe yourself? Are you more of an agnostic or just questioning or just, you know, it's open-ended um, for you? Ag- agnostic across the board. Well, it's more okay. of a, I, well, my stance is, is that, like, I don't know if there's a God or not, or okay. if there's, like, an afterlife or the supernatural, because... The thing you need to understand about me is that, you know, I'm a, I'm like a, like a science buff and stuff like that. I went to school for like geology and stuff like that, like paleontology specifically. I'm currently taking a hiatus, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Neither here nor there. But in any case, ever since, as a, ever since like childhood, I've always had like a, a curious mind wanting to learn about like why things are the way they are in the natural world, whether it's stuff from mm-hmm. the past or stuff currently today. So, obviously, with that scientific mindset where you're trying to, like, go where the evidence leads and coming up with a hypothesis and asking questions and trying to figure out the results, it's like, when you think like that, it's like, I don't know, for me, I apply it to, like, everything, including to, like, my, my, my religious belief, because, you know, during my younger years, of course, I believed in whatever the, my family believed in, because, again, you're a kid you're naive, you're just trying to figure yourself out, and basically your family's there to, like, teach you the way. But, you know, again, you get older, you learn more about the world, and it's like... Yeah, hmm. yeah. Now, everything that I'm being... Not everything, but a lot of the stuff that I'm being taught, it's like, why? Why is it like this? Yeah. And then, and like, you know, like, I don't know, like, sometimes when you have conversations with, like, with like religious people or like religious family members sometimes you fall into that slippery slope where it's like you ask these questions and then they feel like you're challenging them or challenging their beliefs and i'm like and 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 you know like and even the more aggressive ones they're like who are you to question god and i'm just like (laughs) and i'm just like uh like why not i mean why i I feel like i'm a firm believer that people should question their beliefs and convictions Uh because if you don't believe in your beliefs or convictions how do you know that what you're believing is true it's true yeah 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 (laughs) almost like you're testing a hypothesis and i and i totally can relate with you because i went through that as well and mine was smack dab in the first few months of grad school and it lasted for quite a while until I finally found, you know, the well, what I think is, it's not an answer, it's more like it's just, you know, um, and a symptom to an answer, but it's something that is really working for me. So from, from looking back now, I'll just encourage you to just, you know, keep seeking those answers. I hope you do find them. And I do agree with you. I think when we get defensive about our faith, we tend to put God in our own image, right? And there's nothing wrong with questions. I mean, there should be a space for questions, even the difficult ones. Not necessarily mean that you might find the answers, but um, just keep asking your questions. And I do hope you find your answers. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, exactly. And plus, you yeah. know, like, like you know, like, pe- like, ever, like growing up, I've always been told that, like, the Bible is, like, divinely inspired and infallible and stuff like that. So I'm just mm-hmm. like, oh, infallible, you say. Well, in that case, you. Don't, I hope you don't mind me um, uh, probing this real quick. <laughs> but <laughs> usually, they usually they don't, and I, they get upset. So I'm just like, oh, okay. Well, obviously you got something to hide. <laughs> because like, if, no. like if some, because if someone or something doesn't have anything to hide, then when people ask questions, you shouldn't be defensive about it. But like, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And it's, I mean, I don't have all the answers to even my faith as well, because I'm I'm Christian, by the way. And oh, um, but yeah. I, I, Oh. oh yeah, yeah, I'm Christian, and I went through I went through your phase, like exactly where you were, at. and also being a scientist and having to ask all these questions. I think what really helped me was um, um, C.S. Lewis. I don't know if you know of him. He's a uh, he's one of the greatest apologists of our time, and he had more questions than any Christian I knew. And he was one that made me realize that I was okay to have questions because I grew up in Nigeria as well, where sometimes the faith is 
because religion sometimes might have an element of culture infused in it. And there's always that deference to authority where we just tell you what to do when you do it. And then when it came to faith, it was almost like that. The more you kept asking questions, the more they looked at you like, are you possessed or something? Just go with it. And I'm like, no, I have this question. So by the time I left that environment, I moved to the U.S. And I was in this space where people didn't really care what your religion was. And it wasn't like, you know, everywhere. You, it wasn't in everything you did. It actually made me rebel. And I went the opposite direction because I had more questions and nobody was helping me out with them. It, it came to a personal encounter that kind of like um, the force was so great even greater than my doubts and all the questions. And until you go through that experience, nothing anyone tells you would really, you know, push your inflection points, you know? So I do hope you keep sticking because um, I think there's going to be an answer for you, but thanks for sharing that. Um, I, I mean, I imagine that for you, you probably, it took a while for you to get there, but I'm curious to know, was there anything in particular that um, shaped your decision to just start asking questions or it was just a natural flow of things given just how scientifically um, oriented your brain is? Um, It's basically the latter, essentially. There was no traumatic anime sad backstory that made me like deconstruct and like, you know, go to this route. It was more of a Again, just me getting older, me le- me getting more invested into my passions. And then when, like, and, like the more I got into it, the more I'm just like, okay, let's take a step back real quick. Let's look at everything that we've learned at this point about the natural world and about, like, things in general. And then compare okay. it to our, like, our religious beliefs yeah. and ideas and where they stem from. Do these things match? And I, I, I basically feel like a compare and contrast and seeing like which one has more evidence and which one is stuff that we can observe and test and make predictions on and models on and all this other stuff. And I look at it like I look at what like the, the other side of the spectrum. Yeah. And I'm just like, mm, see, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, not to, that's not to say that like religiosity doesn't have like, you know, good quality because it does it does but Mm -hmm. at the same time it's and and then another factor is is the sexuality bit that's another thing i forgot to mention because i am openly bisexual i came out back in 2021 Mm -hmm. was in the closet since like the sixth grade so you can kind of have an idea of like some of the emotional turmoil dealing the going through my oh, head yeah. where like yeah. on one hand i'm like well i largely prefer women 85 percent of the time anyways so it's like what's the what's problem the point? Yeah, yeah. but but it's like if i if, if on the off chance i find a a nice handsome young lad i want to like uh you know have a long-term relationship with and like i just would want it where it's like it's not a big deal right but on the other hand when you're being told that, like, you know, being queer is, like, an abomination or an affront to God, and, like, you're gonna go to hell, and, you know, they compare you to, like, these very evil things that, like, I'm not even gonna, like, mm. mention you kind of put mm. in the blanks, but then you're just sitting there like, wait, so how is me having a romantic and or sexual relationship with someone who's either the same or the opposite sex, how is it the same as doing those evil things that you're talking about? Yeah. kind of a weird kind of a kind of a it's like it's not even comparing apples to oranges at that point because at least apples and oranges are fruit it's more like yeah. comparing apples to cheese there you uh, go uh. <laughs> i know i know it's a terrible comparison but it's the best comparison to make but yeah like besides like the whole religious pressure and plus you know like i said i'm a, I'm a pastor's kid so like obviously you know there's like expectations that people have about you. Yeah, yeah. But then on the other hand, one of the other things about me was like, oh, well, what if women look at me differently for being myself? And then I'm just like, literally every girl or woman that I've like talked to and like dated and messed around with or whatever, like they knew I swung both ways <laughs> and they still didn't care. So I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> if anything, if anything, it would be the, the, some gay dudes that I've interacted with where they give me a hard time for it. It'd be your own people. <laughs> it'd, oh, really be your, it'd really be your own people sometimes. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry you went through that phase where people, you know, I mean, talking about just your sexuality and making you feel less than. 
I, I don't think that should have been done to you. And I'm sorry you went through that. And, um, but I can definitely see how, you know, those struggles you had since the sixth grade and looking at just the environment you were in and how you felt like there was no space for you to even explore that or even, you know, um, create room to be listened to or even felt like you belonged there. And yeah. I think, yeah. yeah, yeah, that must have quite been, been quite a dicey situation for you. And funny that. enough, with the topics that you asked me to pick when it comes to like the gender roles thing, and I know, I look, I jump from topic to topic. My apologies. I know it was it's like okay. the third, your story, Johnny. Go it, ahead. It was it was the third thing on the list, and I thought we we're gonna do it all by like order, but I'm guessing I'm just gonna like jump around. I kind of like that Johnny. type of conversations, but yeah, with the gender roles topic, that was kind of another thing that I, uh, you know. I had troubles with because besides the religiosity and whether or not, you know, women would look at me differently. I'm like, there was a point in time where I hung out with like dudes, which is like kind of weird for me because most of my friends are women. But like anytime I like hang around with dudes, it's like, especially straight men, it's like there's no sort of leeway to like. Like, I'll do things that are just, like, regular, mundane stuff. Like, stuff that's, like, not even, like, overtly feminine. Or, and they're just like, oh, no, you're gay. And I'm just like, no, I'm just, I'm just being myself. I'm just being myself here. And it's like, I don't know, it's, it's like, it's like, in America, it's like, or this, we have this weird thing where it's like, if you're a man and you present yourself in any other way that's not, like, you know, traditional masculinity, like your your masculinity yeah. is put into question. And if you're like a queer individual like myself, it's even worse. Like with women, like y'all, you guys, you guys got a lot of leeway where it's like, you know, you could be, you can, you be can be feminine. masculine and yeah, yeah, yeah well, you, you can fluid. Be, your gender roles yeah. can be fluid without people giving you an eye. Yeah, yeah I exactly. imagine it's harder for a guy. Yeah, 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 exactly. You guys can yeah. be as feminine and, or as masculine yep. or as like, in, I went through that as well. Yep, I know what yeah, you mean. You be, yeah. yeah, you could be like an in between or however you guys want to uh, like, you know, present yourselves, and your femininity and womanhood is never put into question. Meanwhile, if like with me. It's like, as soon as people figure out that I, you know, I swing both ways like a battle axe, it's a wrap. Like, everybody, you know, thinks I'm like this big old fruitcake. And I'm just like, no, I'm just comfortable with my masculinity. That's all. I just so happen to, you know, like both sexes. One more than the other, but still. And it's yeah. like, I don't know. Like I said, like, I, like, as I gotten older, I kind of got to a point where, like, I was comfortable like, I, I know who I am in terms of like how I present myself. So it's like, I'm comfortable with my masculinity enough where it's like, yeah, I don't really, like, I don't know. I feel like traditional masculinity is so limiting, you know, where it's like, you got to present yourself in this one particular way. And I'm like, well, femininity doesn't have that, those sort of limitations. So why do we have those sort of limitations? Like, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, that's that's quite a um, a thought to consider. Just, and I think it also goes down to just the defined roles, right? Um, historically, men are supposed to be stoic, you know, the protector, and you know, have this stalwart figure. And then women tend to be they're supposed to have the softer, you know, the one that is protecting. And perhaps those historical roles have trickled down to what we have in society today, but. Um, it's in, in just seeing how there's now so many dimensions to it and people being um, being free to express themselves. I think it's just really um, a matter of time where we maybe create some space, you know, um, to that. But there was something, um, um, there's a quote by C.S. Lewis that comes to mind about this. And um, I think I'm, I'm trying to, well, let me just try to see if I can record it. He says something around the fact that um, it's arrogance in us to call frankness, fairness, and chivalry masculine when we see them in a woman. And it's arrogance in them to describe a man's sensitiv- sensitivity or tact or tenderness as female, as feminine. And um, so, again, I think both because we 
both traits can abide in one person and sometimes one can tend to be more overexpressed than the other. It doesn't make you less off or more than, you know, but I guess at the end of the day is, you know, that freedom in expressing yourself and um, also giving space to your own personal growth and perhaps even surrounding yourself with people who can support you and nourish that um, growth in you. I think that's just what is, what, what's my, um, my response to you would be in that regard. All right. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. So let's talk yeah. about, I mean, you, you alluded to growing up privileged and um, you had a good life. It seems supportive family. I'm glad to hear that. Um, but I think this would be a question to do justice to who you are as a person. Um, so growing up black in America, what was that like for you? Were they, and I imagine, I don't know a lot about Connecticut, but, I lived in Boston once, and if you can imagine just how New England is, it isn't super, super diverse. But what was it like growing up with um, um, being black in Connecticut? Did you have any sense of otherness? Or uh, I imagine you probably went to school with a lot of people that were not quite like you, you know? In, well, in, funny, in, yeah, funny enough, in all the schools that I went to, there was a pretty sizable amount of black people. So it wasn't like I was the token black kid, you know, whatever. Uh, I see. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't really deal with, like, any extreme levels of, like, racism until, I like, I got a little bit older. And even mm. then, the racism usually takes the form of, like, microaggressions or whatever. Mm. Um, the subtle the, ones, the, yeah. The covert yeah. ones, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, they were definitely pretty covert. Because anytime I, like, interact with people or just do, like, regular shit. And it's like, just, like, I'll hear, like, oh, you talk white or you act white. And... Like, I know that it's dumb. Even as a young kid, I was like, that's dumb. But at the same time, I'm like, why do people have this sentiment where it's like, you know, like I communicate with people and they're like, oh, you talk white, you act so white, like you're so whitewashed, like you're not black enough. And I'm just like, what you mean I'm not black enough? I'm black enough to block out the sun. Like, I, I, I literally stick out as a, like a sore thumb. Like, what you mean I'm not black? Like, it's, it's because like the way I like, communicate and interact with people like i'm sorry i read dictionary since i was five i can't help it <laughs> so i'm just like i don't know it's like it's like with white people when they say it, it's like okay don't flatter yourself you're not the only one who can have a coherent conversation it's like that's retarded and it's like with, with black people it's like why are you saying these things why do you have these ideas, essentially? Where it's like, like you, you're basically tearing your own people down by saying that, hmm. right? Like, I don't know, because it's like, you're basically feeding into like the racist ideas that people have been pushing onto us for the past 400 years since like, hmm. you know, my ancestors were brought here via the slave trades. Like they're literally just perpetuating those same racist sentiments that I'm like even from the beginning I was like that's stupid and like and like and again it's weird because like in America the black community we're like you know we're not a monolith we're full of diversity but then as soon as a black person you know it grew up in a different environment or have different interests or passions or hell even have different political ideas it's like their blackhood is just like tossed out the window at that point and it's like it's like you say we're not a monolith that we're full of diversity but yet when people express themselves in a different fashion you basically toss that diversity sentiment completely out the window yeah and yeah. it's like there, and it's like there's no winning in terms of the whole you're not black enough thing because it's like if you are well put together you take care of yourself you don't cause any you're like towing the line as some would say then again, your black hood is questioned. But then when you act like those walking stereotypes that like the media and, you know, the news and all that other shit, they like push onto us. It's like, oh, well, he or like, oh, he's the typical angry, violent black man. Da, da, da. So it's like there's no winning. If I toe the line, do it and, you know, and basically go a good path and it's like I'm not black enough. But if I act out those stereotypes, 
then it's like again it's the the dangerous angry black man it's kind of like pit bulls essentially yeah it's you like can't win you can't lose yeah it's like do your do, you, you, either you do, I mean whether you do it or not you're still going to be looked at in a certain way and I think it's probably I imagine that this is the part that actually stings the most because it's from your own people right yeah half mm-hmm. the time I mean with white people it's like you know like you know, dumb, you know, like they're gonna, you know, like some of them are gonna say some dumb, problematic stuff. And it's like, you know, with people like that, you gotta keep your expectations low. <laughs> Very low. But like with black people, where it's like, you, you like, again, it, it hurts because it's like, damn, it's your own people that say. It's your own people, yeah. yeah it's like, it's yeah. like, it's like your own people spouting these very self hating ideas, essentially. Yeah. And and, yeah. and going back to the whole self hating thing, besides the you're not black enough thing, like hell, like I was made fun of for being dark skinned, which is funny because I'm not even that dark compared to other people. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, you you already know. You already know. But <laughs> it'd be your own people that be cracking yeah. jokes about Sometimes, being dark skinned. Yeah. Half the time yeah. they be as dark as you. And like <laughs> some of the jokes that I've heard in my childhood, like Thinking about it now, it's funny, <laughs> but back then that shit hurt. Like, literally one time years ago, this kid went up to me and was like, Johnny, you're so dark that when God created you, he was like, damn, I burnt one. And like, <laughs> <laughs> that's not nice. <laughs> yeah, like, looking back at it, it's funny, but like at the same time, it's like, damn. That hurts. <laughs> that that's not nice. It would like, that. I'm so sorry yeah, about that. That's like, so and, nice. and, so and nice. it kills me because nowadays everybody's like, we love dark skins. We love dark skin. Dark oh, yeah. skin is yeah. the wave. But I'm just like, where yeah. were y'all at when I needed you? And it's like, and right, like, right. Yeah, and, and, and like again, when it comes from white people, again, some of them got to keep your expectations low. But with black people, again, it hurts because it's like, where where are you having these? tearing each other down mentality sort of deal and, yeah. I, and i look yeah. and i look at it and i'm like okay colorism been around for hundreds of years obviously uh-huh. the idea that having european features skin, yeah 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 it's being more appealing than darker features like uh, i understand why people have these sort of basically these very yeah. harmful ideas that we should like unlearn i feel i feel as if like we should have unlearned this sort of thing decades ago but unfortunately we haven't and i'm just like why do we still why do we still hold to the sentiment i I don't i don't like that i think it's it's gonna get better i think it's gonna i think it's probably getting better with more um because sometimes people don't even know what kind of that they have that bias towards you know people of their own race and i think the more you maybe even expose that to the light and hopefully you have that kind of spray that is teachable. So I'm, I'm quite hopeful that it's going to get better with the internet and um, just uh, social media as a whole, spreading this awareness and even maybe through, through this podcast and talking about just how um, your experiences have been. I think with time, it will get better. I, I think there's, there's been a lot of improvements in that regard as far as just understanding that sometimes this thing, the, the the worst part of this thing are the ones that, you know, hits close to home, like from your own people saying things like, oh, you're not black enough or you're not this enough. You're not that enough. Yeah. You know? And and when yeah, it came yeah. to like my and, and like when it came to my uh, my self image and like how I viewed myself as a person for the longest time, I because of those jokes uh, well jokes, quote unquote, because it weren't like it may be a joke to someone else. But to me, like. You know, it obviously like makes you question your existence, essentially. Mm, mm. But I don't know. Like for the longest time, like I, like I felt like because of those, like you know, like those uh, dark skin jokes that I got, I basically hated looking at myself in the mirror. Uh, like, yeah, that's how bad it was. Where it's like, how like, old were you then, Johnny? It was like maybe like 12, 13, mm, 14, 15 years old. I'm so old. sorry you went through that. And I felt mm. so ugly. I was like, I, like, mm. my, like my mom was like, Johnny, why would you not look at yourself in the mirror? And mm. like, I, like I explained mm. to her like what was going on. And like she told me about how when she was in grade school, when she was around my age, she hurt her too. She was targeted for being dark skinned. And keep in mind, my mom's like 56, 57 years old. So this was like during like, 
like way yeah, back. I'm quite like, a while. <laughs> you know, like 80s, uh, 90s, 70s and stuff like that. So I'm just like, yeah, I already know she probably had it worse and being overlooked by all the guys in school for being dark skinned. So like when she shared that with me, I felt like I had someone who I could like who could empathize with me and I can talk to without being like Oh, Johnny, they're just cracking jokes, like, like you know, like, get over it, it's fine, it's not a big deal, people have it worse, or whatever. Which, to me, comes off as kind of callous and cold and apathetic. Where yeah. it's like, I'm, yeah. I'm opening up to you about something that's very deep and meaningful, and rather than, you know, giving empathy and compassion like a normal human being, you basically just downplay it. And it's like... <sighs> I know that people have it worse. Trust me, I know. I've heard. No, but still, this is your experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, yeah, like, yeah, it's like your experience. people have told me. Yeah, exactly. Like people have told me stories where I'm just like, Jesus Christ. Now that's really a sad anime backstory. But at the same mm. time, though, at the same time, it's like the experiences that I'm dealing with are still there. And it's unrealistic for me to just be like, well, people have it worse. So whatever issues I'm dealing with, I'm just going to put it in the back burner. So even if I have several arrows through my back and a knife through my heart, I'm just going to like ignore all of that because the person next to me literally has barely recognizable because of how burnt they are. Like just as an analogy, essentially. Thanks for sharing that. And I mean, I think what you're doing as far as just even talking about this is raising awareness about that issue. And I imagine that the 12 year old journey and the 20 something year old journey, you, you've, you've grown a lot. And I hope that whenever someone, you know, um, raises that kind of voice at you, you're able to dispel it and, you know, correct it right away because that's not who you are. You, you beautifully made and you the way you look, you can't help it. I mean, you were born that way. And it's what we actually also befuddles me why we tend to want to look at people. I mean, the way you're born, the way you come out of your mother's who ha you have no saying over that. It's just how you're made. And we have different people around the world. Imagine if we all look the same way. It's going to be so boring, right? So Yeah, kind of, kind yeah. Of, it, it kind of get boring and stale at, at, a, at a point. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And like, yeah, and for me, it's like, it took me years for me to basically get myself out of this cloud, so to speak, where like I was able to be like, damn, Johnny, you look good as hell, chocolatey self. You know, I, I, had, I basically had to like lift myself up because I didn't have anyone to do that. And for the longest time, I and, and you know, this is going to go to like some real deep stuff here. But during like like in high school like senior year specifically, I had this weird conservative phase. It was really weird. It was like around the time where like Trump was getting elected and I was like in this weird conservative phase and stuff like that. And I don't know why. And and at the time, obviously because of like that self-hate that I had and some of like the insecurities, I, for the longest time, had like a resentment towards like other black people excluding friends and family is this just like anyone who's not related to me or that i was cool with i had like this in the back of my head like this resentment and it was because the insecurities and you know like Mm. i remember one of my best friends Mm. yeah and one one of my friends she who she isn't black but she told me that like you know johnny it's okay to like stick up and like defend your own and love on your own it's like because like like if you're like in a situation where you need help, it's usually going to be your own people that are going to help you out. And I'm and I was like, yeah, that's all well and good, but how can I defend and love on my own if my own don't do the same thing for me? Like you're talking about the same group of people who literally made their own, aka me, feel like I'm like an ugly piece of trash that shouldn't exist, and you know I should lighten myself up or you know make myself more black enough, like. You know, stuff like that. I'm just like, why should I do that? Why should I go out of the trouble to help out my own when my own makes me feel like I'm an outcast? And I felt like this. But let me just let me let me pause you a little bit and say that I I agree with both of you because 
the same people who have hurt you are the same people who would embrace you. So there's some wisdom in what your friend is saying. It's just making sure that you're surrounding yourself with the right kind of people. Because there are good people everywhere, regardless of their skin color. You know, people are people, you know, regardless of their skin yeah. color. And perhaps, and I imagine that the people who have done so much good to you, let's just maybe divide them into blacks. Like, let's talk about the blacks in your life. People that you've encountered, you've had with black people. I dare to say that you've had more positive ones than negative ones, but because we tend to always remember the negative ones just because of how they make us feel, hence what is called the negative bias, that stays, stays with us longer. But I dare to say that, you know, you the, the healing you require as far as you even embracing this part of you and, you know, healing from that totally would actually come from that embrace of the same people, category of people that have hurt you. Not the same specific person, but at least, you know, just giving yourself that space to be embraced by, you know, your fellow black people. So I agree with your friend, but I also agree with you as well. As far as that self-preservation, that's why I'm cautioning you to make sure you're looking for the right supportive, positive people. Yeah. And uh, the one and like, despite the fact that I was like in a state of like resentment for a bit, the one thing, and I know mm-hmm. this is kind of corny, but one of the things that kind of made me loosen up and like lighten up the heart so to speak was i was watching an episode of the boondocks right i'm not sure if you're familiar with that uh it's like oh, a American, I know, but no, yeah, yeah 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 yep, yep 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 so, I, I really yeah, miss so it the, yeah, yeah 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 so in season one episode two there was the r kelly episode, right. Right? <laughs> and it was the episode where basically they, oh they had the trial and there was a, a lot went of to black people yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. There was a lot of black people who were defending R. Kelly, despite the fact that he, well, is a king figure. Yeah. And uh, you got Uncle Ruckus yeah. who was playing chess with Robert, the granddad, and yeah. the, he was basically just spouting like this self-hating stuff. And basically, the takeaway from the episode is is that you should love and like protect your own people, even if they say and do things that you don't necessarily agree with. Where it's like rather than just like abandoning them and tossing them to the wolves you take the time to be patient with them and love on them and be like hey you know like you know my my dark skin brother in christ these ideas that you have they're they're not giving like these ideas you have are based on like hundreds of years of like systemic racism like we, we can't no and then like with the r kelly thing it's like yeah there are plenty of black people who've been arrested for crimes that they hadn't committed but r kelly ain't one of them and the fact that he has multiple mm. victims underneath his belt, rather than defending him simply because he's black, you should, you know, toss him, yeah. toss him to the yeah. cell, so to speak. So, again, like, that's one of the things that kind of made me loosen up a bit in terms of, like, the resentment I had. And I went to therapy for it, too, so it wasn't like good. I was dealing with it by myself. But good, 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 good. Like, I was able to outgrow that whole resentment thing. And it's so much, and, like, I, I became so, like, in tune with myself that, like, even with, like, my artwork, the vast majority of art pieces that I've created thus far, most of my characters are black. A lot of them are dark-skinned, but, but some of them aren't. But it's, like, you know, like, you know, obviously I want to take something that I was insecure about for years and make beautiful characters. I found look something. Like, essentially. So it's, like... That's... That's really amazing. That's really, really amazing. Let's talk about your artwork and also even your wildlife photography. Your pictures are really great, Johnny. And what inspired, I know you have a background in geology. What inspired you um, to go into that? And um, yeah, and where do you get your pictures? Do you like go into the wild and sit for a while and then come up with the pictures? Like, how do you go about doing it? What's a day in the life of a wildlife photographer? Okay, well... Interesting questions. Okay, so the funny thing is, wildlife photography wasn't something I've always wanted to do. It was more like in it was more like a hobby that I was introduced to that I just took with it and ran with it essentially. So when I was in school, originally I was a geology major, at, uh, with my specialty being paleontology. So like fossils, that was that, it's, it's still my thing, by the way. It's just you know, obviously I'm not in school at the moment. But in any case, um, when I was doing some internship, well, I was doing an intern, a paid internship for Yale, for the Peabody, they wanted me to photograph some fossils that they found in Morocco. And this is like a brand new fossil dig site that they just uncovered. So, and like this, it's one of those fossil dig sites where the fossils were like really well preserved, by the, uh, by the way. So like animals that normally wouldn't become fossils, they 
they they were, and they were like in exquisite detail. So I worked with them, and I photographed the fossils for them, each one. I I think I photographed like five thousand out of the eight thousand that they brought、mm. from Morocco. So you know, and like I had a bit of a, a history and a relationship with the professors that I was working under, so it was kind of like a good way to basically expand, expand in terms of like me being like wanting to be like a paleontologist and stuff like that. So basically, me photographing the specimens was kind of like that jump waypoint for me doing photography. At first, when I did photography, it was with an iPhone, and I didn't really have a focus. It was more of a I just photograph whatever I found appealing at the time. But then, as I you know, as I you know, over the years, when I started to like, when I actually got a camera, and I started to like. Take walks, like long walks, like three-hour-long walks in like the woods or like a wildlife park or anything like that. And I'll just like photograph like whatever I, I spot. It just got to a point where it's just like Johnny. Obviously, you want to become a professor or like an educator of some sort. It's not a grade school teacher because no, they don't get paid enough. And、uh, just no, be a college professor. Be a college professor, Johnny. And I'm like <laughs> that. So in any case, like you know, I, I you know, like I would go out in walks or like in the wilderness and like photograph stuff, and it was like Johnny, you want you you like remember what you said many years ago, where you said that you wanted to basically share your love and passion for the natural world and science with other people. Maybe we can use this as an opportunity to do that. Where you basically count,、yeah. where you basically go around photographing things, and you give information about the things that you photograph. So it's kind of like, so like my Instagram page that I followed you on, the John Naturalist one. Yeah, it's basically like, yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah it's basically like a field guide or like a a Pokédex、uh, entry, so to speak. Because I am a big fan of Pokemon, so I was like, oh, okay, I could do something <laughs> like this. I could basically, you know. <laughs> You know, do what I do with video games with real world animals. Yeah, I could do that. And、uh, obviously, I have like this app that I use to identify every animal, plant, or fungi that I like photograph. So it's like,、nice. so like I keep tabs on everything. And so far, over the five years of me doing this, I photographed a total of like six hundred plus species at this point. Most of what you get、plant. them from. Um, what, 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 what do you mean? Where I get them from? Like you just you like travel around to get the pictures, or、uh, yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of the stuff that I photographed are from Connecticut, and and then there are other stuff where you know, like because like I've done two solo trips solely dedicated to wildlife photography. So the first trip I took was in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I even went to the Everglades, and this was back in 2021 of December. So that、oh, was one solo trip that I've done, and then the second one I did, which is one of my personal favorites,、um, I went to California, Santa Ana, so like Southern California. I went there last year in、uh, August of 2022,、um, and you know I'm continuing doing solo trips as I go. I'm still trying to figure out where I want to go this year, but I feel like South Carolina might be a potential option. Because one, there's fossil dig sites there that I can like look for fossils and stuff like that. Which it, you know, I'm like, hey, you know, kill two birds one stone. And you know, number two, I, you know, of course, the wildlife photography thing.、Um, I don't really have a focus when it comes to my photography. It, it's like as long as it's not human, I'm, I'm going to photograph it, sort of deal. So, okay, but yeah, that's that's but like quite I said, interesting. Hmm, say that again. I said that's quite interesting. Do you get paid for this, or this is just like a, a hobby for you? Oh no, no, no! This is a complete. This is like my own independent project slash hobby of mine. Like I'm not、yeah. getting paid for this. That's not to say that I haven't been paid for it before, because like I there was a wildlife rehabber who I've worked with before, and like she had like some animals under her care. I photographed those animals too, and then like you know like like a few. Interactions later, she you know she paid me for like my services, which was nice because it was like, yeah, you know, like I do this because I enjoy what I do. I don't do、yeah. this for monetary gain. But the fact、okay. that you're willing to contribute to my cause is really nice. Like, I even have a friend in yeah, I even have a friend from Australia who took some pictures of animals that she, that he 
you know, bumps into him in uh, the land down under. And like, he will send me some pictures to like basically contribute to my project. So like, you know, and I even give him credit for like the pictures where it's like, oh, you know, there's this Australian animal that my friend found and like, I'm giving information about it. But like, this isn't my own picture. This is like my friend's picture sort of deal. Yeah. But yeah, like, I mean, the vast majority of the pictures I've taken on that Instagram account are mine, but some of yeah. them, a good a good chunk of them are from other people who are, like, from other parts of the world or, like, people who wanted to, like, basically want to pitch in with what to I want to do. Your data and all that, things you're doing. It's quite interesting. Yeah. Earlier on, you talked about taking a gap from school for a while, right? You're yeah. on a gap year? Yeah. Can you maybe explain what that really means? Because we have a lot of listeners from all of us who might not know the implication of that. And then um, how long is your gap for and what do you intend um, doing this mm-hmm. time to kind of help, you know, facilitate your learning experience? Well, there was some stuff that was going on prior to me Taking Do you want to talk about it first? Do you want to? This is something you want to talk yeah, about? Yeah, I can okay, go into okay. deep. Yeah, I can talk about it. Okay. Um, I don't know. There was like some stuff that was going on. I mean, between having a bit of a, I don't know. Like my mental health was kind of like declining at that point mm. with like COVID and stuff, and I wasn't. I wasn't in a very healthy relationship at the time. It was like very toxic, and it just eventually became like abusive. Which kind of like, and it's not to say that like I'm blaming the relationship. It was more like it was one of those factors. And like, I don't know, like, like when I was like between like the depression and like the relationship and like COVID, I kind of like lost interest, like gradually with some of the stuff that I was like, I spent years investing my life into. And eventually I started to like lose myself a little bit. And oh. I just decided to, like, take a hiatus from school just so that I can be able to, like, get back to myself. And I have. And I definitely plan on going back to school down the line. It's just okay. that, obviously, with, like, with me having my own place now and me trying to pay off whatever I have to pay off as of currently, it's just, you know, it, like... So many things, yeah. Yeah, it's not that, like, my passions for the natural world and, like, paleontology or anything of that sort have died. It's never went away. Like, I'm a type of person where, like, if I invest into something, even if I take a break from it, that love for it is always going to be there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even though I'm no longer in school, I'm still holding in on the things that I enjoy outside of it. So. When I was in school, I mainly spent a lot of my time with, like, geology and earth science-related stuff. But now that I'm out of it, and, you know, I've gotten more into biology with, like, with the wildlife photography. So it's like, you know, when I get back into school, I might have to change my major from earth science to biology. The goal of being a paleontologist or just any natural science scientist is still there. So, like... You know, being a professor or a curator or like an assistant professor or a researcher, either of those things, whether it's paleontology or, you know, zoology or evolutionary biology or any of or anything that has to do with living things. The goal is still there. It's just obviously I'm just branching off in a different direction with it. If that makes sense. Thank you. It does. It does. And I appreciate your candor about that, especially speaking to the space you needed to take, to take care of yourself. And um, you've talked about this twice now. Just, I think you mentioned therapy earlier on and also talking about you know, your mental health. And I really um, applaud your your openness about giving, you know, your black male as well. And we know how that's kind of not something talked about in those circles. So thanks for your candor about just the importance of mental health and um, seeking therapy when we need to. I appreciate that journey. Yeah, and, and like, it's not like I had to do these mental health stuff alone because, you know, I have family because, like, mental health does, like, mental health stuff does run the family with, like, bipolar disorder and, like, mm. depression and, like, anxiety and stuff like that. So stuff like that runs in the family. So, like, it, because I'm not the only one, I have, like, a support system where it's, like, Johnny, you're not being yourself right now. Like, are you, you, are you doing anything to, like, help you? Like, is there anything you can do that's, like, therapeutic? Are you talking to a therapist? And 
you know, like I've had, like I have people in my corner. Hold on, my uh, phone's about to die, um, and it's okay. plugged up for some weird reason. Hold on, let me talk. Okay, no worries. No worries. I'll, I'm, I'm talking as I go, but okay. But like I said, and and and, and you know, besides having like people around me to like basically support me and stuff like that. Um, again, like I, I, like when it comes like in the United States or in, in a lot of developed countries like Canada, Japan, Korea, and a lot of countries in Europe, when it comes to like mental health and like men, I feel like men t- seem to do de- seem to deal with like mental health issues. Like we, we get the short end of the stick. Like mm. people who deal with mental health issues don't get the help that they need to begin with. But when it comes to us, it's like. Like, hey, you know this really, really short crayon? Well, here's another. Well, here's an even more shorter crayon, and it's like, oh, okay, <laughs> I can barely use this. And obviously, like the suicide rates is very, very high. Higher like, now, yeah, us, yeah, high yeah. as high as hell. So it's like, with that being said, I'm just like, yeah, I'm not trying to to, to die. I don't want to die, and and stuff like that, and like. When it comes to, like, men opening up about their problems and, like, some of the stuff that they deal with and just, you know, being emotionally available, for me, it's not that I have a problem with opening up to people because, again, I'm an open book. I literally share with you, like, a lot of, lot of stuff at this point. But... I appreciate that, by the way. Yeah, yeah, no problem. But the thing is, it's not, it's not that I have a problem with opening up to people in general. It's about who you open up to. Because, like, at this point in my life, my circle is pretty small in terms of friends. Obviously, I got family, and I got two very goofy but lovely pit bulls. But in terms of, like, friends, I only have a handful of them. Most of them are women. Because, like, I feel like with women, I can open up to them more than I can with a guy friend. Not to say that I haven't, but, you know, it's just a, uh anecdotal trend that I've noticed. Um, but yeah, like when it comes to like having a support system to talk to, like I only have like a handful of friends and those friends that I do have, it's like, I literally had to weed out some people, including my ex-girlfriend, because mm. my ex-girlfriend was not one of those people who I could like open up to because it's because it, because in my experience of like being in that relationship, it was either I I'm transparent about what's going on with me or how I'm feeling. And it's either gaslighting, downplaying the people have it worse or I have it worse. So let me make it about me or basically victim blaming stuff like that. So it was, it was like, yeah, I, like, so not everyone you can open up to. Not saying okay. that you shouldn't open up to people at all, but there are just some people that you just shouldn't. Or at least, or at the very least, it's like, you know, like, test the waters with them, and if they prove if themselves them. worthy of you to open up to them, then you yeah. do it. But if, and I feel mm-hmm. like it was kind of, and I feel like that relationship was kind of one-sided, because it was like, she asked me to communicate and to open up to her about stuff. But then when I ask her to reciprocate, it's like I'm it's like I'm freaking pulling teeth. So it's like, okay, like you, you're asking me to do these things that I have no problem doing, or if, or you know, I may have some issues with it because you know sometimes mm-hmm. I have difficulties communicating because you know sometimes I can't tell people what's going on with me right off the bat. Sometimes I gotta like take some time to think about and like, carefully plan out what I what my thoughts are and then explain it with her it wasn't like that it was just straight up you know like hey babe what's going on and it's like nothing and i'll ask and i'll ask and i'm like hey i know something's wrong and she's like and she's like stop trying me or stop pressing me i'm like i'm not pressing you you're obviously not you're obviously not feeling 100 percent. so I, I want to like figure out what's going on so that I can help you and maybe give you comfort or like, come up with solutions depending on what it is. And then when I like give up and I'm like, okay, well, I'm not, I'm done chasing after you. Like I'm, I'm not. And it's like, see, you don't care. You don't care about my feelings. And I'm just like, Ugh. see, and, and, and then I get told that my communication skills are poor. At least I'm going out of my way to be like, Hey, are you okay? And then it, again, it's like that, that, that stonewalling. And then the lashing out. So, 
Yeah. I see. I see. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now, um, finally, it would be your, uh, I mean, 25, correct? And, 24. Uh, 24. Yeah, 24. 20. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay, be 25 well, in June. Well, happy birthday in um, advance. June when, by the way? June the 13th. Oh, that's my daughter's birthday. Oh, that's it. Oh, yes, really? yes, oh, yes, twin, yes, yes. Twinsies. June not, 13th. Uh, uh, a, f- a fourth person with the same birthday. That's funny. yeah. That's my daughter's birthday. Yeah, yeah. So, um, good to know. Uh, so you were born nineteen ninety nine, then, right? Nineteen ninety. Nineteen ninety. Nineteen ninety eight. Yeah, nineteen ninety eight. Yeah. So, yeah. Technically, so technically, okay. so technically, I'm a nineties kid, but because I grew up nineties kid. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'm more of a. Yeah, early 2000s. Yeah, early 2000s, yeah. So you were born just at the cusp of the, you know, Y2K, but they call you guys the internet, you know, babies, the Gen Zs, you, you know, right into it. And I imagine that growing up and even the way the world is right now, it's there's been a lot of changes, you know, just the way we interact with each other from the dial up to, you know, just at the touch of your fingertips. My, uh, and my question to you as a Gen Z would be this. What would you say is um, what bothers you the most about the world today? This world mm-hmm. that we've created, and or the world that, and, and by this world, I mean the world that we have right now. Because again, contrasting the time you grew up, you know, in the early two thousands and up until now, there's been massive changes in just the way we relate with each other and all that. So you could draw your response from maybe a contrast of the early two thousands to now. But the question is, what bothers you the most about the world today as a Gen Z? Mm, what is the world? What There's a lot of things. A okay. lot. <laughs> um, well, let's see. Well, obviously, for one, I just hate, I, it just upsets me at the fact that we're literally in a, in a six mass extinction event right now. So literally, hundreds, literally like thousands of species are going extinct to left, right, and center. And it's like, you know, no matter how much effort we're putting into, like, conserving wildlife, it's just, like, it seems like our effort is kind of, like, in vain, in a way. Well, like, not to say that, like, it's, like, entirely negative, because, I mean, pandas, they kind of bounce back a little bit. They bumped from, like, 2,000 to, like, 3,000 individuals, which is nice, but, you know, at the same time, it's, like, yeah, literally all these cool and unique plants and animals. I may not even have the yeah, chance. Yeah, even the red panda. Too. I heard the red panda is becoming more extinct, correct? You probably mm-hmm. know more about that. The red panda. I think it's that one is also becoming more extinct. Um, the red panda is currently listed as either vulnerable or endangered by the IUCN mm-hmm. with 10,000 individuals. But uh, just know that they used to be way more than just 10,000. But just like the giant mm-hmm. panda because of like deforestation and the, the fur the grid, tree yeah. they dropped to 10, yeah 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 so that's unfortunate mm-hmm. another thing that i kind of another thing that like i have noticed that like i don't like about like the current world is and it's kind of goes hand in hand with some of the stuff that we've talked about like before and i feel like this is just like regular american stuff where it's like you know, you 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 know, you have the racism, you have yeah. the mental health problems, you have the gender inequality and stuff like that, and you have like the homophobia. There's just basically all the regular stuff and the things that we've already talked about in passing throughout this entire podcast is stuff that I have like gripes with in some form or fashion, but. Obviously, because we're pressed with time and we're like an hour and two minutes in, Until, I, yeah. I didn't want to like prolong it. So that's kind of like a general list of things that like things that. Okay, thank you. I mean, I mean, there's so much I can imagine, but it seems that um, the things you the bother you really relates even to is not even above and beyond the personal things like racism and things we've done though is actually the way we take care of the world or even the lack thereof you know uh interference poaching and not taking care of you know um just our resources so you're talking about things that are the um ex- point of extinction or even endangered species and i can imagine just you being um interested in biology and geology those are the things that are really really important to you so thanks for that reminder Jenny. yeah no problem 
Yeah. Finally, where can people find you? And if they want to learn more about you, your work, he, your, I forgot to even mention about your artwork. You draw so well as well. So where can people find oh, you? Oh, my heart. Of course, <laughs> I have. I have. I have. I had to do a little bit of digging about you. You draw so well. And I can see you're very much interested in anime as well. So cool work. Jenny. Yeah, I've been a yeah, big anime yeah. buff since I was a kid. So I can't you know, I'm a big... That, why do you think I have the kimono and the, and the Buddhist prayer? Yep, because I, 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 could tell, I could tell. I could tell. Yeah, I could tell. I just love tell. Asian culture, yeah. I but could in tell, any could case, in, in terms of places that you can find me, um, you can find me on Facebook. I have a main account. So I literally everything that like I do is all posted on my main account. There isn't a second account. So like literally all my art, all my photography stuff, all of the memes and all the like goofy stuff that like I share, all there, just Jonathan in his raw form. And then Instagram, I have two of them. The main account is Shin Alpha 13. So it's S-H-I-N underscore Alpha 13. Again, really weeby anime type stuff. That's that's yeah. how I got. It's literally my gamer tag, by the way. This I is see. Like Instagram account is my gamer tag. I see. And then I see. the photo- Yeah. So then the photography account is John underscore naturalist. So it's J O N, not J O H N, J O N naturalist, and that's yeah. it. And you, and you can. And you, and you know that you find my account because the because the profile picture is yellow and it has like a wasp and then like some flowers underneath, basically like a old style like field guide cover sort of deal. <laughs> nice, nice. In Korean, the word Shin means God. Is that the same in Japanese as well? Hmm. Say that again. In Korean, the word Shin it means God because your username is Shin underscore Alpha, right? I'm saying oh. is that the same meaning in Japanese, uh, right? Actually, no. It's a Japanese one. With Shin, it means either new, like new, uh, the true, like true, or the evolved, whatever. I actually I mean, got the title I mean, because I, yeah. So I actually, it's it's funny because like I got the title because I watched a Godzilla film. Big Godzilla fan, by the way. Uh, and it was same, same, same. And the title of the film was Shin Godzilla. So when I looked up what Shin means, it was like, oh, the new, the evolved, or the true Godzilla. But but honestly, I'm a bigger fan of the evolved, uh, the evolved title because it's like okay, for one, you know, you're obviously growing and constantly evolving as a person. Number one, and number two, well, two, it's because like you know, obviously the whole biology stuff and me being like a scientist, yeah. or like you know, yeah. you know, and three, it just sounds cool. I- I'm sorry, it just sounds cool. <laughs> So it's just like it's just like multiple different things that are like chef's kiss. I'm using this as a title, okay. and then the alpha bit. I I don't think I'm like I mean, an alpha yeah. male or whatever. I'm not like an Andrew Tate type dude. You know, it's just it's just cool. I just like the aesthetic. No, you don't but have yeah. to explain all of that. It was just a Shin that um took me a little because I speak Korean and Shin in Korean means God. I just went because and then it was Alpha, so I wanted to see if there was a interplay because sometimes Japanese words, um, Korean words sometimes have some similar meanings in Japanese as well. In any event, oh, okay. Johnny, it, it's really been a pleasure talking with you today. Um, just exploring your interest, um, your life experiences, and you know, just your uniqueness as well. And I thank you for being very forthcoming about the questions I was asked, and very much so for your time on the show. Really means a lot. Thank you so much. No, yeah, no problem. I had a lot of fun with this. Like I should, I should do something similar to this down the line. I really you appreciate are. you taking your time to like have me on here. Thank you. Of uh, course, of course, of course. Well, everyone, this was the show with Johnny. Don't forget to catch more episodes on the More Simple Podcast. I remain your host, Mo. Catch you guys on another episode of the More Simple Podcast. Take care. Bye. So, Johnny, I'll let you know when.